Welcome to the Space Marketing Podcast, where we look at marketing principles, strategies, and tactics through the lens of space. Information relating to our discussion today and links to the video version can be found in the episode show notes. You can find them on spacemarketingpodcast.com. Please like and follow the podcast. It will get the word out about space. My next guest I met while at Spacecom this past February. Nova Space educates the current and future workforce to transition into the space industry. My guests include Nova Space CEO and President Joe Horvath, COO Christopher Allen, and Vice President of Business Development Miguel Alvarez. Look for their booth at the Space Symposium April 17th through 20th at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. So welcome to the podcast, everyone. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure to be here. So welcome, welcome. All right. Let's kick off with what does Nova Space do? Uh, so Nova Space was started uh, with the specific goal of assisting people with, with joining or upskilling within the space industry. Um, throughout my career as a space professional, I saw repeatedly a lack of opportunity for um, training, education, and professional development opportunities um, within the industry, uh, both on the government side and on the, the commercial side. Uh, and so as the industry is growing so significantly and companies are so hungry for talent, uh, we realized that, that there was a real need for standardized um, and quality training and education available uh, for people either that want to enter the industry or people that want to grow their careers within the industry. Well, and how did you guys come about this? I mean, this isn't something you just wake up one day and say, oh, let's do space curriculum. So how did yeah, well, how did this dream begin? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'll 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 go. This is Christopher. Um, so I've been in the training and education field for oh, almost twenty years now, and most of my career has been helping Fortune five hundred companies install uh, something strategic in terms of new behavior. So a company launching a new product, looking to win customer service awards, um, trying to fix or tweak some cost problem inside the organization, but really working on things that are proprietary to that organization. And, uh, you know, when you're working with companies like that, you get the opportunity to, to use a big budget and, and create something really, really great. And so, uh, you know, I've been doing that for a long time, creating simulations for, it's all companies, you know, it's Apple and Google and American Express and, and Delta Airlines and, and groups like that. And as we were, uh, you know, uh, talking about the space industry, um, and and as Joe was saying, you know, there isn't a, a, a standardized base of knowledge uh, or certification that someone can go out and get and just become a, a space professional uh, until Nova Space rolled along. Uh, we were looking at what what we could do with our various expertises in terms of putting together a product that could immediately kind of go to market and and make a really big impact. Um, and so, you know, kind of the dream was let's put together our, our combined backgrounds um, in education and in space um, and build something that's going to be uh, extraordinarily unique and valuable to, to an industry and really make our mark. So let's go back into that. You, you saw the need, the, 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 the vacuum per se is for education in the space industry. Um, what do you mean with kind of standardization and, and what kind of targets, uh, not targets, um, groups, like you have government, you know, talk about who actually benefits from your program. It, it is. It's everybody. And, and, you know, and when Joe approached me about uh, developing this program, um, we went through a few iterations of, you know, who should we target? Who is our audience? You know, what are we trying to portray to the space industry? And we kind of realized that, you know, the space industry is a multidisciplinary industry, meaning that it takes people from all professional disciplines to contribute to what the space industry does. So we looked at that and said, okay, we need to develop something that doesn't scare away people that have no technical background, 
but also provide something valuable to folks that do have a technical background, an engineering background, even aerospace engineers can get something out of our program. So we wanted to start off with a, a training program that is truly foundational in nature, that teaches somebody that, let's say, graduates from a four-year university with a mechanical engineering degree or a technical college with a welding certificate. They go through our program and they, at the very basic level, get the foundations of what it takes to design, launch, and operate a spacecraft. So that at the end of the course and when they earn their credential, they walk away at the very minimum understanding the language that the industry uses. And we did this because we wanted them to start their careers being more productive and confident on day one, vice doing things the old way where you had to go through an on-the-job training program, if one existed within your company, which at the time used to be NASA, or some type of mentorship program where somebody fed you the information that you needed to know. And our philosophy has been, let's take a more proactive approach and give people that knowledge base up front that is standardized so that, again, they're more productive, confident. And our program, because it is delivered in an experiential learning uh, delivery method, it allows people to practice the things that they're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis in their jobs. Well, let's go back to something you said that you didn't want to scare people off that maybe aren't in engineering, you know, that maybe like for marketing, for example, and you have things for other disciplines, not just engineering and rocket scientists. Yeah, that's a, it's a really important aspect of it. So the space, you know, if you look at any space company, obviously you're going to need scientists and engineers and rocket scientists and those type of folks. Um, but you also need all the kind of standard um, office type professions that any company is going to need. You're going to need um, your legal and your finance and your HR and your project managers and all those and your 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 C-suite, all those types of folks. And as the space industry grows, it has to bring in talent from all kinds of other industries in order to fill all of those types of roles. Um, but the reality is, is that very few of those people actually have any space background or experience. And so it's really important to get them at least a baseline working understanding of all the space mission areas and capabilities, all the, um, the trade space that exists that their company is likely going to be dealing with. Um, and so that way they can communicate properly uh, within their staff, within their teams, um, and then also understand what their user or their stakeholder that they're developing this for are, are dealing with. Um, you kind of alluded to it a little bit. Marketing is a great example. If you want to go be a, a marketing professional at a space company, they need that. Absolutely. I mean, we're a space company. We need marketing people. Um, but the point is, um, what I need is a, a quality experienced marketing person and I can teach them about the type of space things that they need to know. Uh, and that's essentially what we design the courses for um, is to make individuals like that confident and competent in their ability to speak the language. And then in a marketeer's case, to be able to communicate that um, appropriately through all their campaigns and, and all their outreach and, and that type of thing. Uh, because without that working knowledge of, of at least the basics, um, you're really behind the eight ball in your ability to uh, support the needs of your company. Well, and let's talk about the fact that it's not just for, you know, individuals that say your company is looking to get into the space arena and you're looking to transition into the space industry. You know, you're, you're able to create things just for them to get their staff on board. Yeah, and that, that's, I think, maybe one of the things that's most exciting about where the space industry is today and its its maturity as it's it's going through, uh, you know, a rapid period of commercialization and a lot of investment. There are a lot of small to medium-sized organizations that are participating in, in the space economy. And traditionally, a company of, you know, 50 to even 1,000 people they might not have a traditional learning and development staff in place um, or, or even a framework uh, for how to onboard talent to what, what they do inside their organization. And so you know, we're really hitting kind of a sweet spot in that we've already kind of pre-built 
a, a lot of the things that most organizations are going to need from an onboarding perspective, from bringing talent from maybe another industry into space, getting those folks up and ready so that they they don't they don't feel embarrassed or t intimidated, um, you know, and having a conversation or, or working with their team um, about about important issues and, and that they can at least raise their hand and say, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know, you know, it's a question that we ought to be asking, or I know where to go to find that information, even though I, I don't have the answer. Um, and so as, as we look at building, you know, our, our digital credential suite of courses uh, that gives somebody a, a verifiable token that they can walk around and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a space professional. Here's how I earn that. Here's the skills that I, I do have. You know, for, for those for those organizations that are, are kind of building up from from startup phase into something that's now uh, sustainable and, and going to pull them through towards the future, we, we've got a solution that allows them to get started really, really quickly at, at a... a at a price point that just can't be beat. If you were going to go stand up a, your own internal L&D department and start building onboarding to cover the topics that we cover in space, you'd spend three, four, five times what what it would be to to license our solution and, and get your people up and running. And so it, it really is um, tailor-made for organizations to, to get well, in, in an article that I read recently, you talk about how the talent pool is very limited and the the job listings, what was needed is thousands just in the top six of more than what is available and that they just kind of ping pong back and forth. Do you guys want to talk about that challenge in the workforce? Yeah, I, I can touch on that a little bit. You know, one of the things that we've uncovered over the past year and a half, two years that we've been operating is that you know, companies are doing just that. They're trading the same talent back and forth from each other. Um, you know, typically a lot of these companies are located, uh, you know, around these campuses where a lot of the same companies who are competitors are housed. And all the employees know each other. They all, they all know where they come from. They all know how much money they make. And they know that they are in short supply. Um, so what ends up happening is that, you know, these companies are, you know, because there is a talent shortage, they have, they're poaching from each other. And, you know, our, what we tell them is that, you know, instead of doing that, create your own talent in-house, you know, with, with a valuable program. Because what it does ultimately, it, it does increase your collective productivity, right? Everybody is now talking the same language. Everybody understands the same level of knowledge. And you've created your own workforce. You've invested in your people. And that obviously helps with recruiting and obviously helps with retention because now people feel like, okay, this company cares about me. They're training me. They care about my career and my progression. And I have a future here which is important, especially when the talent pool is, is in such uh, high demand. Um, you know, one of, one of the uh, statistics that Chris likes to throw out is that less than 25% of people with STEM degrees are in STEM fields. And that's a problem, right? You know, and, and where does that problem stem from? The other thing that, that we've also noted is that, like Chris alluded to, it, it, it's a lot more cost effective to purchase a program that already exists versus creating one yourself. And what it does, it saves people time, right? Because you have experts in your company. They're, they, they, you know, they know what they know, and, but do they have the time to take a group of, let's say, 20 interns or entry-level employees and teach them the fundamentals of what they've picked up over the past 15, 20 years of their careers? And the answer is probably not. They, that, that time is better focused doing the things that they, at their upper-level management jobs, have to accomplish and leaving that fundamental standardized type of training is best outsourced to something that already exists. Well, and most people that create, you know, the, your small to medium size entrepreneurial type of endeavor, there is no time. You know, it is to the wall and every minute of the day is is occupied with two minutes worth of stuff so yeah, yeah this this helps fill that gap absolutely and and it goes without maybe it maybe it doesn't go without saying in that you know teaching and instruction in and of itself is an is an expertise and so just because you happen to have a, you know a great depth of knowledge or ability in it 
particular segment of space, it doesn't mean that you also have the expertise in order to be an extraordinary instructor or mentor. And, and programs like what Nova Space offers is that gap. So now your most effective uh, team members can be doing the work that they're most productive at, and you're getting a standardized application of skills and practice for everybody else without, without slowing down your best players. Uh, you know, in sales, they often say, you know, it's like the top, the top 10% of your sales team sells 80% of all of your, your revenue for the year. And, you know, the rest of the sales team is just eking along. Well, your best players or your best teammates, you know, you don't want to pull them away from doing the great work uh, just to teach everybody else that they maybe make a step up or two. You want to, you want to do that with a really great formal training program that allows people to learn the concepts and to get practice at their own individual speed. Um, and, and for most of these organizations, they really cannot afford to have their best employees uh, being facilitating uh, on-the-job training. Well, one of the things that I do in addition to the podcast is I do a roundtable called Space for Kentucky. And it is amazing how many people reach out to me that have skills but they don't even know where to begin. So this is a great place to begin and get a certification and add to your resume. Absolutely. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what it was designed for is that type of a person who they have skills that are valuable and are, are needed by the space industry, but they're not necessarily confident uh, in their ability to enter the industry because they don't have that, that standardized kind of foundation. Um, and it really doesn't take as much as people would think, uh, you know, oftentimes we talk about space is hard or, um, you know, the, there's this feeling that it's rocket science and it's astrophysics and things like that. And certainly you can make those things hard. Uh, launching a rocket is hard, but that, that challenge is overcome by a whole group of people doing little bits of it. Right. And so there's, there's a role for, for a ton of people to come enter the space industry, filling those roles that together solve those challenging problems. Um, and you know, one of the things you alluded to, um, Izzy, is kind of those those young companies or those startups. Uh, so often they get so focused on the capability development and on their technology um, that they 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 fail to uh, work on developing their people. And yes, the technology and the capabilities in the early stages are very important. You got to hit those certain wickets and you got to hit your milestones in order to, to keep going. But at the same time, if you're not developing your people along the way, you're not going to have the support to continue growing uh, as you go forward. And you're going to lose all that institutional knowledge that you've developed as they go on to do other things if you're not taking care of them. And, and even if you're in the space and you've been in space... You know, there may be a lot of aspects of space that you are just completely ignorant of. So, you know, just assuming that you know everything there is in an industry, you know, having a fresh view for your staff that maybe be able to bring in things that you never thought of and can impact you in, in other ways that you didn't expect. So knowledge is never wasted. It, is he, that is such an important thing. And it, it's one of the reasons that we decided to approach training and professional development to start with a real foundational standard, um, because it really does breed that type of creativity and out of the box thinking. Uh, and I'll use an example. So oftentimes uh, when satellites are launched, um, sometimes there's extra room on the satellite to put other things. Uh, and we call that a hosted payload. And so you might be up there launching an optical satellite that's going to be taking pictures, but there's room on there to maybe put some antennas for some communications payloads as well. Let's use that as an example. So in that case, um, you know, you can, for one, the company can make extra revenue by selling room on that spacecraft for these other things, but understanding what orbit that's going to be in for your use and who those potential customers are that you could sell that space to is important, right? So there's there's some there's some use cases that would work and there's some that wouldn't based on how you're going to be using it. Without having that basic understanding of, of that breadth of space capabilities and mission areas that are out there, you're not necessarily gonna make that connection 
uh, and find some of those creative uses or uh, new ways of doing things that, that haven't been done before. And that's why we feel it's really important to get that broad understanding um, and that kind of better generalist understanding from the beginning of your career. Uh, because so often what we see is people that become very stovepiped and specialized in like one very specific area of how we use space. But when we talk to them, they really don't know necessarily all that much about many of the other things that are going on. And I think they're missing out because of that. Yeah, and it could be just that maybe your satellite is not equipped to be able to have communications. But if you just make this one little tweak you can actually have revenue come in and that can be a game changer. Yep, exactly. All kinds of partnerships and new ideas and creativity. um, It, it, like you said, it all comes from, from having the knowledge to be able to take advantage of it when it, when it presents itself. Oh no, what I was going to say is, is you hit, you hit on a great point is that, you know, even your experienced folks that have been in the industry for a while, uh, one of our early uh, students uh, and an aerospace engineer, who you would think, okay, this person knows everything there is to know about the space industry. And maybe at what point they were taught that. Um, but, you know, she mentioned that over the years, like Joe mentioned, she's been stovepiped in certain departments or areas that a lot of the information that she was able to pick up from our course was, yeah, at one point she was taught that, but she never really specialized in it. So it opened up her her mind to, okay, I remember that now. And oh, okay, that's how this ties into what I'm doing now now today in, in, in real time. So, you know, this is not only designed for entry level employees, it's designed for that person that's been in the industry doing satellite communications for the past 10 years, and now maybe wants to do a transition to optical systems or position navigation and timing constellations, or even uh, launch operations, right? It allows them to pick up that knowledge and hopefully maybe even make that transition into into that industry within their careers. Hold on to your boosters. We will be right back with my guests from Nova Space after a brief message from our sponsors. I met you at a at Spacecom and I know you're getting ready to go to this space symposium and you have a booth there so you're really into to getting that word out you know every company has to market so what have been some of your marketing successes in business and getting the word out well I, I number one I think given uh, people a chance to to try our our solution. Um, we offer um, we offer a free course that folks can sign up on and and immediately start learning. And and the the question, no matter where someone is on their professional development journey, that that I like to ask is, would you do you want to learn more stuff this way? Uh, is this is this your preferred um, your preferred experience? And because I, so many of us get fire hosed with information all day long. There's an unending number of things that you can read, uh, videos that you can watch, um, but none of them are active. And what what really I think makes us stand apart from from most everything uh, that you could possibly encounter in the, in the space industry is is we're, we make students do things. I mean, they they have to act. Um, and the kind of the hallmark of, of what we put together is, is challenge-based learning. So it's not just here's kind of the textbook definition of, of orbital mechanics, but there's a challenge that we put in front of you. You have to solve that challenge, and all the actions that you do inside our, our digital material is to overcome a particular challenge. And we're giving you feedback based on, on the choices that you make. And that's the number one eye-opener. I mean, there's... Everybody that we're going to encounter in this in this arena uh, has experienced education in their life, and I I would I would argue that almost ninety five percent of their educational experiences have been poorly designed instruction, in that we lecture to we lecture to people, we give people things to read, we tell them you ought to know this, 
don't worry, in some time in the future, you're going to need to, to know this or do this, but we don't contextually uh, uh, give students uh, a marker that they can hold on to and say, you know, here's where orbital mechanics is going to enter your day as a space professional, and here how, here's how it's going to influence the decisions that you have to make. When, when folks get to see our free course and they, they start to play with it, they instantly see how it's different than everything else that they've experienced. And that makes a lasting impression. And so, you know, I, I, from a marketing perspective, I would say, you know, the more that we give, the more that we're going to get. And I, I think that the free course that, that we've offered really does that. Because the more that we give that away, more people are going to go, yeah, for sure, this is, this is the way I want to learn space or here's how I want to further my space career and then it's and then it's really easy because then then the ball's in their court and and they really do come back and and when we start to have that conversation with organizations do you do you want your people your employees learning these concepts this way um it, it's an it's an easy transition from from marketing to sales to you know the, the most important part which is operations where we're really helping organizations onboard their people and, and get them onto the program. And, and I want to touch on something you said that is kind of important to me. If um, you read my book, my very first one, I am a really big proponent in asking what people need. You know, don't create something and then try to make it fit your audience. Ask them first. You know, it's a cup of coffee. And the, what you get out of it may be a completely different answer than what you ever thought of before. And so asking people how they want to be educated is huge. Because, you know, I think the days of sitting in a classroom, you know, are numbered. Because we, we you know, I can't take that class at midnight. No, and, and our, reading, our reading habits have changed, which I think is another important aspect that adults and kids need to be aware of. Since we have so much access to text and information, um, you know, if, if you're in a, a working adult, you're getting email, you're getting things on Slack, you're reading stuff on the company intranet, you're reading, you know, things that are happening, you know, kind of out, out on the regular internet and company documents and all these sorts of other things. And then to pile on top of that, here's more reading that's gonna help you learn as adults, what we've learned to do as all of this information hits us is we skip and skim. We, we look at yes. the first line or two, and then we ask a question, is the rest of this document something that's going to be important to me like right now, right? Because I've also got email and I've also got text messages and I also have chat, right? And so, you know, when you're designing a, a learning program and, and you're really hoping that people are going to read with a purpose, that they're going to take this information, they're going to practice it, they're going to make it part of who they are, know that you're also competing against all that other information that sits out there. And so if you don't, in my view, if you don't make education an active experience where people really have to lean in and do something, chances are they're also skimming and skipping other information while they're reading the text that you put in front of them from, for, for education. And just know that they're not going to internalize that uh, like they would, you know, sitting down and and reading a you know a, a, a compelling story. We just don't engage with text like like. Using what you just learned to do a challenge, you have to apply it. So what yes. you think you may have read may be completely different when you go to apply it, and it doesn't work. Right, and then you go back and you you might revisit that text again or, or mm -hmm. interaction or, or other piece. And now you're viewing it in a different light because you're stuck. You've got a challenge that you need to overcome. And now that, that, that content is the thing that's gonna unlock the challenge that's in front. So you're, you're reading or you're consuming that with a purpose of the answers in here. How do I take that and now apply it uh, and, and see the consequences really, really quickly? And that, and that, that starts to cement uh, a memory, uh, and it starts to contextualize ag again for that student. This is this is where someone's going to ask me about that, or where I'm going to have to apply that, um, and that makes it uh, memorable. It makes it meaningful to the individual, uh, and hopefully, 
you, you start to become motivated of, I want to be in that situation. I want people to ask me that. I want this challenge uh, because it's going to be part of a, a career that's rewarding. And, and when you create those challenges and they actually do them, they create something, I don't know if this is a technical term or not, but it's something I call layering. So you have a bit of knowledge here and then you get a no bit of knowledge from over here. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have a problem that's in front of you. You're able to, to go through all the layers of learning that you've done to come up with a solution that is unique to your perspective. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, reading text isn't going to do that. Right. Nor is, nor yeah. is taking, nor is taking a quiz. <laughs> yeah, no. you know, I was, I was just, I was going to hit on that, Christopher, it, which, which kind of dovetails off of that, which is we actually specifically designed our courses so that it's not watching, you know, videos and clicking through slides and then taking quizzes. We actually don't really have quizzes in our courses, but we do ensure that people have mastered the learning objectives. And the way we did that is by designing it so that in order to demonstrate your mastery of the learning objectives, you have to complete the challenges. And through doing the challenges, we can verify because you won't be able to get through them if you can't, uh, you know, show that you've synthesized that that information and are able to apply it in a real world way. Um, and so it, it's very different from what you'll see uh, in other learning platforms where it's clicking through slides and answering some questions or, or watching a video. Um, and and we and in doing so, we've actually been able to make it um, something that is adaptable to the individual student. You know, with classroom learning, it's designed to meet the needs of the center of the bell curve. And so there's always people that are going to be bored and, and, you know, they already know a lot of what's going on. Or there's going to be people that are having a lot of challenges and they're falling behind. But, you know, within a classroom, you, you have to teach to the majority of the class uh, for time. The wonderful thing about digital education is that um, if you design it properly, you can be a really good steward of your students time by allowing them to move fast through things that they already demonstrate that they know and and being able to spend more time on the things that they're having challenges with. And the beauty of a computer is that it doesn't get bored. It doesn't get frustrated. It doesn't have a problem repeating things. So it can it can give challenges and allow people to practice things that they're struggling with as much as it needs uh, that you're not going to get in a classroom setting. And, and that's one of the things that I, I think is really wonderful about what we've developed. And it doesn't matter where you live. Exactly. No. <laughs> So I, I did my my master's. I finished it in 2018, and it was all online. And I I picked the university because I was able. I was working. I had to do something digital. So that this would have been really something quite, and still is very. I'm very interested in going forward myself personally. Oh, and I was going to just touch on a point you just made. Is that that is the trend that we are seeing uh, as far as adults and and the the skilled talent that we have in this country and globally really is that adults are busy and adults want to learn new things and they want to transition to new careers and you know going to a traditional academic setting to get a master's or a PhD is probably not needed and it's you know and it's it, it, it may not be needed for what you're trying to do I use the example of a software engineer let's say you're a great software engineer that's been doing great work in the aviation industry or in the automotive industry for example and you really want to go work in space. You've always had this dream that you want to participate in the space industry. Well, you don't need a master's degree. You don't need a PhD in astronautics to do your software engineering, you know, for a company like SpaceX, for example, right? You just need to pick up the language of the space industry and pick up a little bit of that knowledge and how the process is completed and how the engineering process works. And then you're going to be able to, again, be more productive with that knowledge on day one, vice spending two years of your life getting a master's or a PhD. And then you get to learn new stuff. So I, yeah, like I was saying with uh, Space for Kentucky, um, you, one of the, the per people that I have right in my front of my brain right now, he is, he works for automotive and he wants to get into the space industry and doesn't know how to, to, to kick that off. So this is definitely going to help him and many like him. 
Yeah, you know, and th that's a huge part of the population. You know, there, there's the, the more uh, technical side of things, the scientists, the engineers, that group. And there's the support staff type, like we talked about, like, you know, HR and finance and recruiting and things like that. But there's also that skilled, um, that skilled labor and technician side of it that's badly needed uh, by many of these oh, companies. Yes. We're talking welders and HVAC and plumbers and um, builders. All of all of those types are are, are very much needed by uh, the folks that are building all these amazing capabilities, and they can't get enough people. And the amazing thing is, there are tons. Like, let's use welders as an example. There are lots of amazing welders out there. Um, they just don't know that the, the space industry needs them. Uh, and you teach them a little bit about space and, you know, some of the minor differences that they need to do for, for a, you know, the space environment. And now you're off and running. And, and the cool thing is that those, those welders that you teach about space, so they understand what's unique about welding for the space environment, they're going to be the ones that come up with new ways of doing these techniques that are going to be even more effective. But without giving them that education, they can't put that together and come up with those new technologies and new methods that haven't even been thought of yet. One of the challenges for our schools in our state is that they have a three-year wait to do some of these like A&P mechanics and, and, and things like that. But you can go to a welding school and get a certification and then maybe go to you and get a certification and boom, you're off and running without having to wait that three years and still not have exactly what you need. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And, and that's the direction the country is going. It really is. You know, those, those, those trade skills, uh, I think that type of direction, it, uh, there's a real hunger for that. Um, and that's really our focus is, is skill development, you know, um, from a, from a traditional academic standpoint, you know, you think of, of education and higher learning, and it's really more about research and theory and, you know, how you think about things. Whereas, um, we're really focused on training to skills that can be applied immediately, uh, and to performance because ultimately that's what a company cares about is can you perform do you have uh, actual you know skills that you can apply um, that's so much more important than a more theoretical um, you know traditional university learning not that I uh, dislike that I've got multiple degrees and I love that stuff but but that's not what companies need right now they they need people who can do things uh, and that's that's what we want to do is really help help these people with these skills um, get the knowledge they need to transition and, and, uh, and be of use uh, on day one when they start a job. So we're going we're gonna to flip a little bit. And uh, what are some of the, the marketing challenges that you have on getting this word out? Because, you know, this, in, in this noisy world, getting that message to the people that need to hear it, it can be kind of a challenge sometimes. So what have been some of your challenges? Yeah, I, I think I can speak to that. Um, you know, we truly have a very unique product that has not been seen in the space industry. Now, I, allude, I alluded to it a little bit in that the space industry used to be NASA, and it used to be the big government contractors that built things for either NASA or the DOD. And they could afford to hire somebody and give them 15 years of on-the-job training to get them up to speed. That's no longer the case in this environment, uh, in this competitive environment globally, right? So. You know, part of the challenge is, you know, letting organizations know that we exist, that this type of training program that is effective, it's not PowerPoint based, it's not a video lecture, it's not an in-person seminar. It's a highly effective way of transferring knowledge and skills to an individual that may not have that knowledge and skills, and it gets them up to speed very quickly. That's challenge number one. You know, the other challenge too is, you know, what makes us different? When people think about professional development or workforce development programs, they think of one or two things. In-person seminars that are given during your lunch break, right? And the only thing you're thinking about is, okay, well, when am I gonna be done so I can eat my lunch? Or two, you know, go and take this uh, virtual training, which is nothing but a deck of PowerPoint slides, and you're just clicking through to get to the end, print your certificate, and give it to your HR department. Well, you didn't really learn anything. And we wanted to solve that problem. And that is one of, the, one of the biggest marketing challenges that we've had is, you know, how do we effectively tell organizations that we are very different from the training methods that you have been accustomed to in the past?
and how have you tackled that? Well, Chris, I think you alluded to it. Uh, you know, one of the ways is by is by demonstrating it. Uh, the best the best thing that we can do marketing wise is getting people to 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 have exposure uh, to our courses. And and one of the ways we've done that is by offering a free course on on space missionaries and capabilities. Um, and it, it, it's a r relatively simple lesson, but it it allows them to get inside of what we develop and, and see what it's like um, and the benefit uh, and it really and how fun it is. I mean, th that's the other side of it. We, we seek to make learning fun and developing these skills, you know, exciting, something that you you are looking forward to getting back to and doing more of not, um, you know, uh, regretting it and, you know, trying to get it done as quick as you can and, and be done with it. Um, and, and I think the more we can keep people engaged by making it fun and exciting and interesting, um, that really helps uh, because at that point, um, the learning cements itself more deeply when it's something that you become passionate about or are passionate about. Um, you know, one of the other challenges that marketing wise that occurs is that um, traditionally space didn't need to do any marketing. It was NASA and the U.S. government, right, and the intelligence community. Um, it was them. They had their own budget. They had their primes that, that you know, regularly uh, were the ones on contract. And it was just a cyclical thing that just continued. Um, and so there, there really wasn't a need to market space in any kind of commercial way. Um, and I think so one of the challenges is that in general, there really isn't much space marketing expertise out there. Uh, just like with, yeah. with all of these jobs, right? And so uh, that's one of the challenges is that the space industry itself as a whole is having to learn um, what you know marketing is, if you will, uh, because it never had to do it before. Uh, so I think that's, that's a real change. Um, and I think paying attention to the, the, personally, I think paying attention to the computer industry uh, and the internet, uh, how that developed in the 90s and 2000s is a really good analog. Uh, to something that started out kind of immature and then found itself uh, maturing both in you know training pipelines and marketing and um, making things going from proprietary systems into open systems that you know everyone has access to and you can build off of. I think that's the direction space is going as well. Yeah, in fact, that's why I wrote my first book is because I saw that you know in the space industry they haven't had to do it. It's not like, you know, soap or shampoo where they've been in the market so long that they're, they, they, I mean, even they are struggling with a lot of it now, but they haven't had to do it. So what is this thing marketing? And that's why I wrote my book and do the podcast. So exactly because they just don't know. So here's a, a question for you. And I know that we're getting close to the time. Uh, where do you see the market, the space, where do you see the space industry in about 10 or 20 years? You guys want to go first? I can tell you mine. I know exactly what mine are. So there's three things that I think are going to be huge within the space industry in the, in the next 10 or 20 years. One is data. Uh, there is so much information being collected in space. Um, it, it's really almost an overload and figuring out how to um, uh, package that, store that, uh, analyze it and make it useful to customers uh, and make it, you know, a true um, a type of industry around the data being collected in space. I think that that's a huge thing. Uh, another, another thing I think that's going to come about is changes to energy uh, here on Earth, actually. So the development of, of new, smaller nuclear uh, systems and better uh, solar type of energy systems in space is going to start um, both improving our ability to do things in space but it's all that technology is also going to transfer to earth and i i think going to be revolutionary particularly nuclear uh with small nuclear reactors and things like that um and and the final thing that i think is going to be a a big change is in or on orbit manufacturing um so once we can start building things in space using materials there instead of having to bring them up from orbit it changes the whole paradigm for launch cost and you know what you need to bring to orbit uh and i think that'll be really revolutionary uh as that starts to come about as well and whether or not we can leave our lower earth orbit and go out to other planets we've got to be able to make stuff wherever we go so absolutely you know, yes i think i i agree with all three of those points so, and uh, last question, 
What final words do you want to leave your audience with today? What do you want them to think about as they go about their day? We, we've touched kind of on the, on the edges of, of skill development, but I, I will say regardless of what industry you're in, the skills that you have today are probably not the skills that you employ every day at work, even four years from now. I, I think, you know, if you look back at the computer systems or the software systems that you're currently using today, they're, they're likely mostly different than what you were using five years ago. And what that brings to bear is that your skills are no longer as durable as they used to be. Um, and I think the duration in which your skills are valuable to you and to the organizations that you work for are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The, the actual everyday task component. And so I, the number one thing that, that I tell everybody is you need to make an investment in yourself. And it starts with, you know, imagining where you want to go and what you want to practice and what you want to be good at. Uh, and know that practicing needs to be one of your core competencies. Not, not the new skill that you're learning, but getting comfortable with practice and in, investing in yourself and learning new things. Because you're going to be asked to do it a heck of a lot more going forward. And, and then the sec second thing is... Um, you want to find combinations of things. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how the space industry tends to be stovepiped, where you get people with deep knowledge in one particular area, um, but they're missing the skill to be able to branch out and collaborate with other people. You know, as you're investing in yourself, it, I think it's the combination of multiple domains that really makes you as an individual far more valuable because you're able to bridge two different groups, you're able to pull people together. Um, and so kind of imagining where your interests um, and what gets you excited um, might be in the future and continuing to invest in those paths so that you've got, you've got skills that can bridge, I think is, is what's, gonna, what's gonna make us all, um, all, all more valuable and, and be more joyful about the work that we're doing. If you'd, if you'd if you spent 10 minutes on the internet today and you started to look at what, what artificial intelligence is going to do to your job and what it's going to take away, <laughs> I, I would say that that's probably not time well worth spent. But imagine not only what do you want to do and what is going to bring you joy in the future, but what's going to bring other people joy. I think if you start investing and kind of running head first into whatever that's going to be, um, you're going to be in a, in a great spot. And for, I think for, I'll speak for me, but I think for the rest of my colleagues at Nova Space, that's something that we're really, really excited about facilitating because um, we want to bring the best of what people have to offer into this industry because that's, that's how we're going to come up with new inventions and, and we're going to reach those next big plateaus that we're all dreaming about. You know, and and I, I have I, a saying, life is too short to be boring. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. You know, I, I think from an organizational standpoint is the, you know, from, you know, if, if you're if, if you're a young company, if you're a, an existing company, your capability, your unique capability is only going to take you so far. If you don't invest in the people that are going to sustain your capability and really, you know, grow it, then you're going to be behind the bell curve. And your competitor who may invest in their people they're all going to be speaking the same language. They're all going to have the same understanding of what they all do as an organization. They're going to, they're going to beat you out every single time because they're, they're functioning as one well-oiled machine that is knowledgeable of what they do. And then they're going to be able to take that unique capability that they have and they're just going to win out every single time. Even if you have a better product, they will still win out. So it's not about who has the best one. It's about who has the best team. Absolutely. And, and I, will leave, I will leave it with the saying I always use, it's all about the people. That's what it comes down to. The people, the technologies can, can be amazing, but if you don't have the people to, to, to design it, build it, operate it, and make it you know, successful, it doesn't matter what you've got. So that's the way I look at it. 
Well, awesome. And thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story to space. And, uh, you know, uh, I look forward to chatting with you guys again. Sounds excellent. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Azia. Please subscribe before you head on over to my YouTube channel for bonus footage. Links to the YouTube and other social media channels can be found on spacemarketingpodcast.com. A special thanks to Joe Horvath, Chris Allen, and Miguel Alvarez from Nova Space for sharing their journey. Be sure to check out their links listed in today's show notes and look for their booth at the Space Symposium April 17th through 20th. I hope that you have found this podcast useful for your journey as you reach for the stars.